Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is part four in our study of the book of Proverbs. Today we're going to discuss chapter four. Uh, the first three chapters have already been discussed. There are already uploaded videos on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I hope you go back and watch, uh, watch all those. Uh, with me right now is Brother Bill. Brother Bill, would you say hi to everybody? You, you muted, Luke. I can't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I asked you to say hi to everybody, and we couldn't hear you, so go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, and I, yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. We've been having problems with Google Plus the last few days, but yeah, I am, I am the Panda Man Evangelist. And, uh, you know, if you tab on my name, I like to evangelize, and that's what I do. And I occasionally wear a panda suit. But I'm not the only one who wears a suit because we know that Brother Luke has, 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 has got a secret Batman suit. So. <laughs> Oh no, he outed me. He outed me to the world as, as my alter ego as a Batman. <laughs> That's when I was younger and I had a much better physique, though. Okay, brother, uh, let's go right into this uh, and start talking about um, Proverbs uh, chapter 4. Uh, I'm looking it up on Bible Hub, up where it's where I'm reading it. So I'll just start reading it and then ask you your uh, interpretation of these verses. Um, hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding for I give you good doctrine forsake ye not my law for I was my father's son tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother he taught me also and said unto me let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Let's stop right there, brother. I uh, ask you to uh, uh, respond to those first few verses. Well, yeah, yeah, the verse is oh, it's good, good common sense advice, you know, he's, he's given his children. You know, if I give you good doctrine, Forsake you not my Lord. So he's not giving him bad doctrine or something's going to harm him. No, he's given, giving him good stuff. And he goes on, far as my father, son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. So yeah, common, common sense, good advice. You know, he wants his son to have longevity and, and a good life. You know, that, that's just up the first four. But yeah, that goes on. And what verse did you go to, Luke? Uh, the uh, the first four verses. But let me ask you while you're on the first verse there. Uh, uh, can you identify who is speaking and who the writer is here? Oh, well, yeah, I'm just making sure I'm muted. Right? Yeah, so here, ye children, the instruction of my father and text. So that's that's obviously King Solomon. Speaking there to, to, to his to his child. Okay. Well, so King Solomon is talking about. Uh, this is I, I'm your father. I'm giving you instructions, and he says, "For I was my father's son." tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother he also taught he also no he taught me also so what do we learn from this about him teaching his son and then he learned from his his father yeah yes yeah, so it's a lot of generational kind of advice going along there so obviously david taught Solomon. well david taught solomon but obviously he was special in his mum's eyes <laughs> anyway we know that and then obviously now he's teaching. It doesn't, I don't think it specifically says who he's teaching, you know, because he's so many kids, so Lord knows which one, unless it's a general one that's drawn his children. Mm -hmm. uh, 
see. All right, I wasn't sure if I was muted. I think uh, I can keep it just unmuted. Uh, and, and I don't, we're not, we're not hearing any feedback or way. If there's just the two of us, I don't see any f feedback. Do you see, do you see any reason for us to keep muting? Uh, I'll, I'll keep, I'll mute when, when, whenever you're not asleep, but you can, you can keep unmuted. Okay. Right? Because when I'm muted, you get obviously no feedback whatsoever. And it's just us anyway. Yeah. All, all right then. Uh, so yeah, it's. I think we're going to find out later on that uh, there are part of the proverbs that was not written by King Solomon. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, that is is the case. Just as uh, some of the Psalms, I think, were not written by King David, uh, but um, uh, most of it was written by Solomon. And so here we think we believe this is King Solomon talking to his his son, passing on him to him wisdom, as his father had done before for him. So I guess the first thing we need to understand is that it, it is the job of a father to uh, try to teach your son, your children, wisdom. And of course, we're fortunate now because we have the book of wisdom here, the the proverbs. For, uh, for us, and that's, that's what we're doing right now. So I'm hoping that uh, if you're a father out there, maybe you can use the book of Proverbs, and some people read a chapter every day because there's 31 chapters. So each month you could start the, the cycle over again and, and uh, continue reading and discussing it with your son. And I, I think that is part of a responsibility of a father to teach their sons wisdom. But unfortunately, many of the fathers don't have wisdom. <laughs> Sometimes maybe the father has to learn this, these wise sayings uh, along with the son. All right, brother. Um, if you don't have anything to say about that, let's move on to the next part. It says, uh, uh, keep my commandments and live. Let thine heart retain my words. Um, let me, let's talk about that for a second. I, I talked about that in the study I did on uh, Abraham on Sunday. I'm sorry, I'm sorry because of the technical issues, you weren't able to join me then. But when I discussed Abraham, I was, I was talking about these commandments, these, the, the Mosaic laws. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is Solomon. Uh, this is uh, after the time of Moses, so, so we know that Moses came before David and Solomon. So they they uh, were Israel was under this legal system called Judaism and under the Mosaic laws, uh, 613 laws. Ten of the laws were written on stone that we know as the Ten Commandments, but there were really more than Ten Commandments. There are 613, and the important thing I think for everybody to understand is that these laws were given to Israel. They were not given to the whole world. Uh, and before Israel received these laws from God uh, through Moses, uh, the Gentile world was under another set of laws just that wasn't written. It was called the law of conscience. And the scripture says that these laws were written in man's heart intuitively through our conscience. So the Gentiles did not ever have these Mosaic laws before Moses, during Moses, or since, since Moses, and even since, since Jesus and the church began. These laws were only given to the, to the Israelites. They were never intended for Gentiles to adopt these laws. Well, what, what do you have to say about that, brother? Well, yeah, that's that's what I believe, yeah, yeah, because you know the law was given unto Moses and it was given unto uh, the children of Israel. You know, it doesn't mention that, that the law was given unto the Gentiles, and you know we see, you know, throughout the New Testament, especially with the Pauline epistles, that, that the Gentiles were never under the law at all. So yeah, you know, the law was given, you know, as a covenant sort of thing to, to the Jews, and and it was conditional in those type days. You know, if the if the, the Jewish people or the Israelites, you know, know kept the law, 
you know, that they were promised, you know, longevity, they were promised bless and, and all manner of good things, i.e. life. And that's probably why Solomon is, is hitting home this, you know, because you'll live long, you'll have a good life if you keep these. And we know through history, as soon as they rejected the, the laws that were given unto them, you know, that a lot of trouble occurred. You know, the times they were plucked out of their land and, and taken captive or or chastened by God for, for for not obeying these laws is almost, you know, embarrassing. But yeah, you're right, they were for the Jews and they were, you know, if obeyed and kept, which is impossible anyway, but if they were to be obeyed and kept, you know, at least to the heart, that then, then, then Israel and the, and the children of Israel would be blessed and, and they would live long and they would prosper. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that the, the church today has two major misconceptions about the, the Mosaic laws, whether it's the, uh, uh, the, the uh, what the moral, what they call the moral laws or the laws uh, as a whole, the, like the ordinances, the legal statutes, uh, it doesn't really matter. None of that was ever given to Gentiles. Now, and even, so that's number one. Number two is that, uh, Israel was was never told that they would be able to receive eternal life in heaven by following any of the Mosaic laws. They were told, as we see right here, uh, I gave numerous examples of this in, uh, I think, uh, oh, I don't know, probably in, in uh, Deuteronomy, I believe it was, uh, I cited numerous examples that say the same thing as what you're reading right here in Proverbs. And that is David is saying, uh, uh, keep my commandments and live. Uh, he's not talking about uh, live eternally. He's talking about receive life, uh, you know, a, a blessed life. You're going to find that the Mosaic laws, the, the Israelites were promised that they would receive blessings. They would receive uh, abundance, good health, good crops, and get it enter into the promised land. These were the kind of things that God promised them in return for being obedient to these laws. But he never made following the laws part of a formula uh, for getting into heaven all right brother. yeah yeah that's right yeah that they, they were laws for like i said god's blessing abundance and longevity you know these are common sense laws you know primarily so they could be you know blessed and, and they could have a long life you know and that, that was the objective you know it doesn't say as you and you rightly said that i can't see nowhere in the commandments where it says if you keep all these you know, you're going to receive eternal life because that wasn't, it wasn't talking about life eternal. It was talking about life temporal, life physical, and life either blessed or cursed. Yeah. So somehow, at some point, some people took these mosaic laws and made it part of a formula. And, you know, A plus B equals C, you know, like, okay, um, uh, believe and, and follow these all these commandments and you'll get eternal life but see following any laws was never part of a formula so that someone could attain eternal life it never it was in the past it isn't presently and never will be in the future the first thing I I've said this in my series on dispensationalism I've taught it again in my series on, on Paul onlyism and now, and when I was talking about Abraham on last Sunday, and again now, this subject keeps on coming up about the, the Mosaic Laws. And every time we see it, we're going to see that it's so that you can have a long life, good health, blessings, and abundance, not eternal life. So I, I don't know how this ever entered into man's thinking, and it became part of uh, some people's doctrine for salvation, but it was never intended for that purpose. Uh, we can go on, but I'll give you the last one on that, brother. Yeah, yeah, and you all agree, and you all agree. Yeah, because, you know, even in Deuteronomy, he says, that, uh, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that was set before you life and death, blessing or curse, and therefore choose life. And the context of that, it is being obedient to these 
this moral code, the commandments, you know, what God has asked the children of Israel to do. So it was life or death, blessing and cursing. It was never eternal life or eternal damnation in the scenario. Because, you know, salvation comes by faith through Christ. Yeah. Well, uh, we've said before that uh, their wisdom can help us in so many ways in our lives, but the first aspect of wisdom that a person should want is wisdom unto salvation. So I can't. I don't think we can say this too often. It's it's worth repeating over and over again that wisdom unto salvation is understanding that we cannot ever get to heaven through personal merit through our ability to follow commandments and laws. Uh, that, that's the first thing that makes us wise, realizing that we, it's impossible. That's not what the law was intended for. And even if we, we believed it's intended for that, no one can follow the law completely anyway, so we, everybody would fail. Uh, the, the wisdom under salvation is acknowledging that we are hopeless and we need someone else to save us, and that person is Jesus Christ. Uh, all right, I move on unless you want to say more on that. No, no. Okay. Uh, uh, verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Um, all right. Uh, now, all of a sudden, is, is it talking about a woman here? If you're talking, I can't hear you. No, 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 no. I was just listening. I was waiting you to carry on what you were saying. Uh, I was asking you the question, as since now it's put it into a gender. It says, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Uh, now, why is it all of a sudden talking about a woman? Is that the case? That's interesting. You know, the way I perceive it, I could be wrong, but the way I perceive it, it is, you know, you have a child, a small child, and predominantly, you know, while the child is young, a tender shoot even, it is the mother that tends, loves, and keeps safe. You know, the father would, would be, you know, supplying all their needs and that lot of work and etc. So does the mother, but generally the, the mother would be the one tending to a young child and, and preserving the young child, you know, nourishing the young child, you know, even from newborn, you know, breastfeeding the young child. So it's, it's essential. So I think that's why it, it does put the law, listening to that, the, the, the voice of the law, that it is, you know, very much like, like a woman, you know, tending a child. That's how I see it. All right, brother. I, I, I like the way you put that. I think that was a very good uh, application, um, po possibly the reason that uh, wisdom has become personified. Uh, but I can hear some people now yelling at their computer screen and saying, that dirty guy, that Panda man, he's such a sexist, uh, talking about women's roles versus men's roles, and women do this, and men do something else. And you know, what what do you think of this modern uh, reaction to the idea that you just expressed? Well, yeah, but well, we can see we can see it pan out in society today. What this modern, you know, ideology has done it's called no end to harm. You know, it, it's broken up a godly and natural order, you know, between, you know, God, man and woman, you know, and I've often said, you know, I don't belittle women, I'm not a bigot, you know, man and woman are equal, but are equally different. God has set certain roles for men and women, you know, I'm a man, I can't give birth, and I'll be nowhere near as a good mother as a, a woman would be, and, and, and vice versa, you know, a woman you know, is, is, is not a, a man, you know, and has to spend time with the children, you know, and, and, and it's caused problems in society where you have, you know, women going out to work and the children being left with either the father perhaps or 
or in most cases a, a babysitter, uh, that's causing a mess. You know, society is slowly breaking down because people, you know, are rejecting the godly institution of how things should be within the constraints even of godly marriage. Yeah, uh, I, I certainly agree with everything you just said there. Uh, however, uh, these traditional values and tra traditional viewpoint that uh, has been common throughout the world, through, throughout all civilizations, all of history, and now today uh, it's being challenged. And uh, if you hold to these traditional viewpoints, then uh, you're could be called a, a bigot, a sexist, or some, some kind of a pejorative because you hold to these traditional viewpoints that have been proven to be the best way over time. But now they want to look at us as like a unisex uh, situation where men and women are interchangeable parts. And uh, to me, it's so obviously untrue uh, that men and women are that they are not interchangeable. I mean, you you look just at anatomy, for example. I mean, we're op we're polar opposites. Uh, even while we're designed for reproduction, we're designed to to be a partnership. Where a, a man's uh, organ is is designed to enter into a woman's organ. We're designed to fit in that way. And that is an obvious thing that, that anybody should not be able to just dismiss and act like it's not important. God made us that way and made us different. We're not the same anatomically. Uh, we're, not, we're not the same in size. We're not the same in strength. And, and we're certainly not the same in terms of being able to nurture a child. A man cannot nurse an infant. A woman has the mammary glands that she's made for that purpose. And now we know that science shows that men's and, brain, men's and women's brains are actually different. Uh, that shouldn't really surprise anybody. And we know that the chemistry, the hormones in men and women are different. You've got estrogen and testosterone, and the balance is totally different. And God designed and made men and women different so that we could work together cooperatively with different roles, different functions within a marriage and a family that would give us the best results. And to have a woman go off and be out of the house and work, even though financially it might be the best thing for them in some cases, maybe women, some women have the ability to earn more. But, uh, uh, but it's not really the best. That's not how God intended it. And it's not going to give us the best results in a family. Uh, the woman should be staying home, nurturing the children. And the man who is stronger is able to go out and do the hard labor, hunting and fishing. And now we have a different type of economies in the world with the industrial revolution. So a man doesn't necessarily have to hunt and fish to, to provide for the family. But the man's role is to provide and the woman's is to nurture the children. And if anybody thinks that this is bigotry in some way or sexist in some way, well, I say, okay, they call it what you want. But it's clear to me that that's the way God made us. And that was, that's what the ideal is. Brother? Well, yeah, yeah. We've, we've got, like I said, we're saying that the fruit of this kind of, you know, moral entropy, you know, of, of you know, roles being reversed and roles being destroyed. We have, you know, delinquency, is going absolutely high wire that you know divorce rate is exponentially growing and growing and growing and, and it's causing no end of problems it really is and you've got to be you know people might call us bigots and, and sexist but come on anyone with any brains any common sense can see that the, the fabric of society being eroded to the point now i believe of no return and and that is fundamentally not only because you know, people's uh, moral ideologies have changed, but especially because families are, are being targeted, I believe, by the enemy and destroyed, and it has destroyed the fabric of society. You know, but it's, it's, you can't stop it now because the damage is done and, it, and it's exponential. But what we're saying as Christians, we can see it's wrong, 
and, and with our children, we can do, you know, a, 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 as, you know, Solomon is saying, you know, listen to wisdom, you know, and try and take on board, you know, some some godliness and, and some, to be honest, common sense. So, uh, so here we see that uh, this was also done uh, in the previous chapters to referencing wisdom and uh, making it a uh, personifying it and feminizing it, uh, wisdom. And you say that there possibly the reason it is feminized is because the um, a mother is a nurturer, and so we got off onto that tangent. And I think that was a worthwhile tangent to go off on because I think it's part of wisdom is understanding the natural uh, way God intended everything to be. All right, let's go on to the next verse. Um, um, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Well, Solomon says wisdom is the principal thing. And I know that Paul uh, uh, is arguing in, we discussed it, I think, previous show on, on Proverbs, uh, the idea that uh, Paul says that uh, understanding is not the principal thing, that it is uh, love. What is it? First Corinthians, is it 13, the love chapter? We, we went over that before, but he says you can have wisdom, you can have understanding, you can, you can have faith, you can have all these different wonderful qualities, but without love, it's, 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 everything else is meaningless. So how do you reconcile Solomon saying wisdom is the principal thing and Paul saying love is the principal thing? Well, again... It brings us down to uh, eternity or eternal life or, or temporal life. And yeah, yeah, for, for a sensible, long, happy, blessed life, you need as much wisdom and understanding as you can get. But in regard to salvation, you know, it's, it is the only rule command. You, you need love. You know, if you haven't got love, you, you ain't got nothing. So all the wisdom, yeah, all the blessing you may receive yeah. on earth, and even the longevity, yeah, these are good, but it will do you no use whatsoever in eternity. You need love for that. And, we, we, you know, what is interesting is the love it expresses, I think, in Corinthians, it is the agape love. It's like a godly love. It's a sacrificial love. So it isn't just like a, just love your dubby, love your wife and pat her and look how it is. It goes beyond that. It's a deep, godly love that I believe is imparted, you know, to, to the saints. And we receive that, you know, when we believe on Christ. And that, and that is that is the eternal love, as opposed to, like I said, the temporal wisdom. Well, you know, we, we know and we teach uh, over and over again that... Uh, the only requirement for salvation is, is faith in Jesus for your salvation. Uh, love is not a part of a, the formula or a requirement. Uh, you don't have to be a loving person in order to get saved. Uh, and yet, uh, Paul, uh, in, in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he uh, seems to... Uh, emphasize love even is greater than faith he says you, you can have faith even enough to move a mountain but if you don't have love you have nothing so how are we to take that again i'll take it as in you know you to, to be safe we need that initial faith to be saved when we're saved <laughs> we're, we're, we're filled with love across so that the that, that whole chapter and those verses are talking to someone's already saved so now they've had the rest of the faith and received this eternal life they next go on to the greatest thing of all which is love so faith saves us faith secures us but then we move on but you know we get that loving part of it was the love of god you know that you know blows your mind to be honest and when we get that you know if we haven't got that or 
you know, we have got it in us. All saints have got that love in us. But unless we actually use it and show it to others, you know, it doesn't count to much more than a hill of beans, which is a shame because every saint has got that, that imparted love, you know, that, that you know, the love that passes all understanding, like the peace that passes all understanding. You know, yeah, we've got it, but we need to show it, don't we? And, and I think we all fail there sometimes, but I think that's what he's trying to hit home. You know, he's taught to save people that, you know, could be boasting that, 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 that they could be martyred, i.e. thrown in the fire, or, you know, that they've got massive faith, they can move mountains and all this lot. But in comparison to the love that Christ has shed abroad, and then us imparting that same love to other people so they can come to Christ, it, it, it's pointless and useless. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is a very important thing to understand. He is talking to people who already have the faith unto salvation. Uh, and so uh, now he's emphasizing how important love is, uh, not as a requirement to get saved or to prove you're saved necessarily. But I, I will tell you from my own experience, you know, people, I've had a lot of conversations with people about their conversion experience. And uh, uh, some people, they think that their conversion experience is the the test for everyone else and you must have had the same kind of experience that they had uh, otherwise they're going to challenge whether you even had a real conversion some people say they had tears they had brokenness contrition or whatever like they, how they want to describe their experience and say if yours wasn't the same they, they're going to doubt your salvation and i uh my my experience was was love and other people have experience of fear fear of condemnation and and uh, you know uh, the sentence of, of death in the lake of fire hell and so that because they're afraid of hell they they want to be saved well whatever whatever their re the motivation whatever the exactly experience it, it, it varies but i'll tell you mine was all about love because uh, as I read the gospel account of John, that's when it dawned on me, it really hit me that Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to become a man and die for me. And he did it because he loves me that much. And it, it just, it really got me. And, and as the scripture says, the reaction that we have once we understand that it says, we love him because he first loved us. And that's what happened to me. Once I really got it and realized how much God loved me, Jesus Christ loved me so much he died for me. There's no greater love than giving your life for a friend, he said. And once I got that, my natural reaction is I could not help but love him in return. So love, uh, and now, then he goes on to say that the, the only thing he really asks of us after we get saved is, he says, I forget all the com commandments in terms of all these technical things. And, and what, 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 it, I'm really going to narrow, condense it down to this. He's just, uh, just love God and, and, and love your fellow man. If you do that, God's going to be really happy with you. We'll be, we'll be pleased with you if you just do that. So that's how important love is, according to Jesus and according to Paul, too. Uh, Brother Bill, respond to that, then we'll introduce uh, Brother Stephen here. Yeah, yeah, spot on. You know, love, love, love is it. But what always amazes me is, you know, God can manifest himself in many ways, in mercy, compassion, and even at times with a bit of wrath and chastening. But it amazes me, you know, the verse where it says, you know, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Not, not that God manifests love or God likes to love, but the essence of God himself, the Trillion God in person, is love. God is love. And that, that, that's a mind, bro. That shows you how important, you know, love is uh, above and beyond everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brother Stephen has joined us. I'd like to him to introduce himself, and uh, I'm glad you could join us today, brother. Uh, we are studying the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, and we've done about five or six verses so far. I don't, have you heard any of the discussion before you joined us? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, Brother Luke and Brother Bill. No, I've not heard any discussion. Just literally got on. Uh, I'm afraid my camera's down, not working. So, no, I haven't caught uh, any of the discussion, but I'll get Proverbs 4 out and uh, catch up with you, yeah? All right. Very good, brother. We'll, we'll, we'll just carry on. I'm glad you, glad you could join us. And uh, uh, just uh, I'm going to ask you to respond to these verses as we read them. Um, so we, we see that uh, Solomon is trying to teach us some wisdom as, as his father had done before for him. And when he's talking about wisdom, he personifies wisdom and feminizes wisdom. He refers to it as a she. Uh, wisdom is, and she pr will preserve you. Uh, so uh, we, we talked about why possibly he was referring it in that way. And, uh, now, now we're asking ourselves about this. Um, he says wisdom is the principal thing. And we compare that to what Paul said the principal thing was, which was love. And Jesus said the principal thing is love. Once we get, once we have faith and we get saved, the principal thing then, of course, is love. And Solomon here is talking about wisdom. But Bill says that this is talking in the context of having a blessed life. If you're wise, you're going to get a lot of blessings because you're making wise decisions. Uh, so he says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Uh, I'm going to ask if uh, Brother Stephen wants to respond to that. Sorry, Luke. Uh, sorry. Uh, just catching up with you, brother. I'm still catching up, so um, just pass for me for a moment, mate. All right. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, let me see. We covered that. Uh, Bill and I discussed that. Wisdom is the principal thing. Now it says, verse 8, exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. And of course, she, he said the same kind of thing in verse uh, two, when he said, uh, I talked about the law uh, and uh, keeping the commandments and live. And we talked about how uh, if the, the Jews, or the Israelites would follow the Mosaic laws, then they would have received blessings. And now Solomon's talking about the same way, wisdom. Uh, Brother Bill, what about verse 8 there? That yeah, well, is one, one second, one second, one second. Eight. You're muted, Brother Luke. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, Brother Bill, are you ready to, to explain verse 8 to us? I guess not. I'll go back and keep explaining it then, okay? Uh, exalt her, meaning wisdom. Exalt wisdom, and she shall promote thee. So exalt wisdom, and wisdom will promote thee. Uh, she shall bring thee to honor. So if you exalt wisdom, wisdom will promote you. Wisdom will give you honor uh, when you embrace her, when you embrace wisdom. So that, that's the, one of the first things you, you need to learn regarding wisdom is that you should really greatly desire wisdom. And hopefully by, by doing this study on Proverbs, you know, we're, we are all desiring more wisdom. And I hope that you people who are watching, that uh, you know, you're desiring wisdom because it's saying here, embrace her, embrace wisdom, desire her. Uh, all right, let's see if anybody wants to respond to verse eight at this point, or I'll go on. No, no I'm back again. Yeah, I, I had problems with me all because me, as you know, me all is playing up at the moment. And everything was going blurry, so it's, it's hard for me to see. So I've made the the writing bigger on my browser. So I can actually read properly. So yeah, yeah, where it says, exalt her and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. So they are going, it's again to do with, with physical life. 
that throughout life, you, you know, if, if you embrace wisdom, common sense, and, and a godly lifestyle, you know, it will promote you. Because if it promotes you, by default, it's promoting God, who is the giver of this wisdom and this godliness in the first place. And also, it says, you know, it's going to bring you honor when you do embrace it. You know, so, you know, this is good stuff. This is good, sensible, godly wisdom for, for, for a decent, happy life. Yeah, yeah. I uh, my son came over to visit yesterday. He's uh, 35 years old, and he told me about an experience he had earlier in the day. I won't try to tell you the details all about it, but I was really very proud of him that because the way that he handled the situation demonstrated to me that he had a lot of wisdom. He's 35 years old. He was very wise the way he dealt with this situation. And I actually had a similar situation yesterday, and I dealt with it quite well myself. And I, I was real happy. It was not easy because it was uh, I was on the verge of letting the situation get to me. Uh, so it bothered me a little bit, but I didn't didn't uh, outwardly display my my uh, uh, feelings. And so it turned out really good because I was patient and I was wise. And my son, he did the same thing. But I'm 64. He's 35. So I told him, I said, your, 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 your wisdom is far exceeded mine at that age. I, I was quite foolish as a, as a young man. And uh, I, I know I'm wiser now. I'm Not that I'm all wise, but some people say I'm a, I'm a wise guy. <laughs> not, in a, not in a complimentary way. But uh, it's nice when you when you you see your son actually displaying wisdom, and that's kind of what this whole thing is about here. He's saying, "My son, uh, I'm going to teach you wisdom. I embrace it. My father taught it to me." And when you see it in your son, it's really a wonderful thing to see that your son is 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 wise. Uh, go ahead, and, and anybody wants to comment, and then I'll move on. Well, I was just going to say, I find it very interesting, you know, because um, some people say, you know, I've heard this comment before where people say to you, well, you know, you haven't got any common sense. And I ask the question, what is common sense? Yeah, and they all look at me a bit blankly as if say, well, it's the knowledge of knowing when you're doing something is right or not, and whether you're being wise. I said, so it's about wisdom then and not common sense. Yeah, so some sometimes that's quite an interesting way of looking at it that common sense is wisdom they're one of the same thing that's just a little something uh, more of an observation more than anything else well brother since you brought up common sense let me ask you do you know what the problem with common sense is what you mean other than the fact that I don't have any <laughs> 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 you're, you're, you're right. The problem with common sense is it's very quite uncommon. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I yeah. agree with you 100%. I no disagreement with you there, brother. Uh, brother Bill, uh, before we go on, you think I was to add? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to agree with what, what you and you know, Steve just said. Common sense has become very uncommon. You know, long gone are the days when you know, people had a better wisdom and a better, you know, godly sense. So, you know, since then days are gone, so is the, the sense that the common sense were, you know, so you yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I think that this is another way of, of, of saying that, uh, look, um, common sense, unfortunately, is not so common after all. Wisdom is not so common. And that's why, that's why, Saul here is saying you should desire it. How, how did he express it here? Uh, embrace it. And uh, in, in another verse, it talked about seeking after it and going after and desiring it. So desire it more than silver and gold. It's more precious. You should desire it that much. Uh, so uh, obviously, Common sense is not really that common, and wisdom is not that common. And people have to actually desire wisdom, pursue wisdom, and sometimes people get wise after many, many years of 
learning the hard way. You know, uh, some people say uh, experience is the best teacher, but uh, I, I would say that uh, a, uh, experience is a very hard, stern teacher, and that's learning the hard way. If you can learn from other people's experiences, then you're wise. You didn't have to go through that hard ordeal yourself to learn the lesson. So, all right, uh, I'll go on unless you want to add to that. Verse 9, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Verse 10, hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. All right, again, what is he promising him for learning and becoming wise? Exactly, that comes, exactly, that's just, you know, agreeing with what we've been saying in the first few passages. It's to do with longevity. To, you know, all these boys saying that it's to do with blessings temporal on earth. So, yeah, he's just obviously, you know, we've been writing that, it's confirmed what we've been saying. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, let's welcome Brother Ronnie here, uh, Hood Minister, St. Hood. Uh, Ronnie, have you uh, listened at all yet? We're on, on Proverbs chapter 4. I think we're verse 9 right now. Uh, have you listened at all? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, no. I uh, just got back about a half hour ago from the oncologist. I got all my medications. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I was doing. So yeah, Proverbs chapter 3? Chapter 4. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay, well, uh, let me just tell, tell everybody, this is Brother Ronnie. His YouTube channel is Hood Minister or Saint Hood. And uh, I hope you subscribe to his channel. And I'm happy you could join us. Uh, now, I'm going to just continue reading where we left off. And Brother Ronnie, I'm going to ask you first to respond to this first. So, so be ready. Here it comes. Uh, um, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I'm on verse 11. I have, taught, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Uh, hold on. I said straightened means here. Hindered. Okay. I think you've read, just read from the wrong. Have you read from the right place there, have you, Luke? Uh, I'm getting some interference there. Yeah, that's what I've got, Bill. In the way of wisdom, I've lived thee in the right paths. When I rose, thy steps shall not be straightened. In the earnest, I shall not stumble through the earth. Where were you? Up to uh, 14 or 13? Uh, I think uh, I just read. Uh, up to 13? Uh, I read verses 11, 12, and, and uh, 13. Okay, no, no, I just left 11 and, 11 and 12. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. This is Solomon talking to his son. When thou goest, thou, thy steps shall not be straightened, and when thou runnest, Thou shalt not stumble. What I'm going to do is just ask anybody to speak who feels like they want to say something about that verse. Anybody, go ahead. Well, Solomon was a, a, a was a very wise king, given wisdom by God, and he's obviously trying to pass on some of that wisdom onto his son here. All right, let's move on. Uh, verse 14, uh, no, verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. 
verse 13, anybody who wants to say something, I, I don't want to call on yeah. someone to put you on the spot, so if you have something, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah fine again, like I said, it's just again, those verses and 13, it's just reconfirmed, you know, what we're saying, you know, keep her, for she is thy life. Again, we're talking about temple life. If you keep this, this, this wisdom, this instruction, you know, it, it shall, you know, preserve your life and give you longevity. I think also it's also showing us uh, that wisdom is something we all need to try to obtain to give us the knowledge to choose between things at times, the right path. Um, and it's easy sometimes not, like you said, well, like we said earlier, not uh, easy for people to find wisdom uh, or common sense to do the right thing. So I think there's some examples there for us. Uh, I, I think we should get rid of that term common sense. Let's start calling it uncommon sense, okay? Okay, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after all, isn't it really uncommon? So having, having good sense, having wisdom is uncommon. Uh, all right. Um, uh, that's the whole oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother. We're listening to you. Oh, okay, I, I still hold to that uh, where knowledge, you know, you can gain knowledge and all the counsel from people you want, uh, but reading reading scripture gives you that too, but it's, I think the best wisdom you can have is to experience, to either your own or somebody else's who, who gives you that wisdom, uh, and that helps you to, through your life, not to go to the left or to the right, but, you know, to get through it. Maybe not the same way somebody else did, but maybe close to it. And Scripture gives us a lot of wisdom. So that's how I see it. Well, uh, I just said a few minutes ago, I don't know if you heard me at that time uh, or, uh, or if you disagree, but experience, there's a set of other thing, experience is the best teacher. And that's why... Well, I didn't hear that. Uh, you, but well, I, I say no. Experience is a hard, stern teacher. It, learning mm -hmm. through experience is learning the hard way. And what Solomon is hoping to do here is impart wisdom to his son, so he doesn't have to learn the hard way through experience, through making mistakes. So, so you think, so you yeah. think Solomon went through that already? Uh, well, I think he's trying to teach his son wise things before he makes these mistakes. All the things we learn in Proverbs are telling him to, to do certain things and don't do other things. And if you, do, if, you do, if you follow this advice, your life is going to be far better off. So uh, he's, he's telling his son, don't learn through experience. Don't learn through experience. Uh, Let me tell you what to avoid and what the right thing to do and learn from these wise sayings instead of learning the hard way through experience. Hmm. Okay. For a while. I think that's quite an interesting point, actually, because, um, you know, when I was a uh, small little boy, I remember having several discussions with my father along the similar sort of lines and how he was trying to impart his experience, his things that he went through when he was a younger to try and help me understand some of the things that I might uh, face as I, go, as I grew up and as I got older. I, I think there's definitely some parallels here. I don't know what uh, the panelists have any views on that. Yeah. Well, maybe you're getting both here because even though maybe Solomon didn't go through a lot of these things, but don't forget that's from God. I mean, his wisdom is from God. Uh, so, I mean, you, you got that right off the bat. I, I still like, uh, <clears throat> I, like to my own son or grand, grandkids, uh, I like to impart something to keep them out of trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, tell them what, what's uh, smart, what's not smart, you know. Don't do this on the streets, don't do that. Don't mm -hmm. say this, don't do that. Because around here you get shot, you say the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay. We'll go to the next verse and you'll see an example. You find this all through Proverbs, we're going to see the same kind of a thing. And we look at verse, we look at verse 14, he says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go, not, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. 
pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. Uh, so I, I think this is just another example of a recurring theme where he's trying to tell his son, avoid uh, making these mistakes. Uh, uh, and because, yeah, he could learn, he could go through those bad experiences and he can learn from his bad experiences, but what Solomon wants to do is teach him wisdom so that he can, doesn't have to learn the hard way. Right, but where's Solomon getting that wisdom? Well, I don't know if he uh, got it from God or from his own bad, his own mistakes, uh, probably both, but uh, he certainly doesn't want his son uh, and anybody reading this, the whole point of it right. is to teach us to, hey, the, it, the, here's, here's a guide for you to follow in your life. If you will do this, uh, don't make these mistakes. Yeah, if you make the mistakes, yeah, you're going to learn from it, but that's learning the hard way. Well, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm, I'm just saying that I think it becomes um, – both ways are good. Uh, but here Solomon, whether he got it from God or he got it through, from experience – or somebody else just told him about it. I don't know, but uh, his wisdom is good both ways, either from experience or directly from the Lord. You can depend on both. Mm -hmm. All right, you're entitled to disagree if you think it's better to go through a bad experience and learn that way. Uh, I'm, I'm an idiot. You know, I, I'm kind of a, a, a halfwit, so it's a lot of times I have to go through uh, something to, to learn. You know, I mean, uh, I've, I've done things in my life that. Uh, I should have learned the first time and I didn't, so got me in trouble. Uh, Brother Bill, any? any I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to echo what the <laughs> minister said. Yeah, that's the story of my life, that is. I learn in the end, but I always land up going through the hard way. And I, sp I suppose I didn't have the benefit of being a Christian from, you know, from a small child and, 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 and having the, the proverbs and, and stuff read to me. So it was no use, you know. I, I've, experienced, I've experienced the hard way. And I don't know if hoods like me at all, but even sometimes after the third and fourth time, the penny still don't drop. But it does it does right at the end. Yeah. What, what is that scripture in the New Testament that says God doesn't choose many that are wise or, you know, noble? <laughs> I mean, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we must be extra special then. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, let me make an application of this verse to uh, what we deal with every day here on YouTube. I've talked about this thing many times before, but I think this is a, another way uh, of applying these verses here. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Now, I, I, I've encountered a lot of people on YouTube that I think are wicked. Mm -hmm. Some people are uh, just hateful people. Uh, they're they're anti-theists. They hate God. They hate the idea of God. They hate, particularly hate Christianity and Christ. Some people are even wicked Christians, where they are believers and yet, unfortunately, uh, they still are mean, hateful people. And what doesn't matter. Anybody who is like this, Solomon is advising. He's saying, if you're wise, avoid them. Don't enter the path of the wicked. So, like, when I see a hangout, and, you know, I enter a lot of hangouts for a short time. I'll be in there for a few minutes, and I see that, hey, this is someplace I don't want to be. And I leave. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's how I choose to do it. I don't want to enter it. If I enter it, I realize, wait, I'm in the wrong place. I don't want to be here. And he says... Uh, Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. So to me, uh, that's that's how I see an application of this verse in my daily life because I get invitations to join hang hangouts every day. Well, somebody told me this when I was a kid. I, I would have it would have kept me out of a lot of trouble if I would have listened. You know. Mm-hmm. I think all of us would probably say that. So. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else before I go on? Okay. I'm going to go to verse 16. 
talking about avoiding these evil people. He says, for they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Uh, we're going to find out. And, you know, I've, I've read Proverbs many times in the past, and as I recall, this is a very popular subject for Solomon in his teaching, avoiding the wicked people and the bad situations. And uh, I, uh, you know, what comes to my mind, what I'm, what I have to deal with uh, in my life each day is the the possible wicked people I encounter on YouTube. So um, that's that's an application that I can see for it. Okay. For they eat the verse seventeen. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The wine of violence. Hmm. Why doesn't he say, why couldn't he say the bread of violence? Why does he say wine of violence? I think it's because that when people get into that uh, situation, when uh, like that, it's almost like they become like drunken uh, with violence, and all they can do is that one thing. They get so fixated on that one sort of area um, and that is sort of like it's almost like they're like drunken with it and rather than eating it it become it's almost like it takes them over and you're drunk you, you're out of control <clears throat> Can I throw my two cents in? What? Can I throw my two cents in? Yeah go ahead Okay for the eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence I think that was applied to comparing that to Christ. Um, the eat the bread of wickedness is exactly opposite, you know, from the bread of life. Drink the wine of violence in, instead of uh, the wine of Christ, you know, forgiveness. I mean, it's just the opposite. So, every time I see bread and wine, you know, that's a, I keep thinking back to the Lord, you know, on the supper. So. Oh, no, thanks, brother. I, I didn't even uh, associate that for some reason. Uh, that's very good. And uh, I, I was thinking about the the wine being uh, as what? as as brother uh, brother Stephen said, the wine of violence. In other words, some people get intoxicated from being violent. Being violent is like a drug for them. They get, they get high on it, being a violent person. And then other people, they're not violent until they drink the wine. The wine, the mm -hmm. alcohol, uh, is, affects some people where it does make them violent. So, But I don't think that's the, the, the actually meaning he has here as far as not drinking wine or you'll be violent. But he's, he's using it as a uh, – like a – an allegory or whatever simile or whatever the correct word is that it's uh, uh, that uh, the wine of violence. Uh, um, I just want to just confirm what you know, Paul Ronnie's just said. That's you know spiritually that is spot on what he's just said. Absolutely spot on. You know in in spiritual terms and in a spiritual dimension. If you want to dissect that 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 verse. And it is complete opposite and complete contrast to Christ. You know, Christ being the bread of life and the wine, you know, being the new wine, the new covenant, the, the, the new life, the love that Christ imparted into it, you know, that is completely opposite to Christ. And, and yeah, I think, I think, you know, Brother Ron has hit on something deep and spiritual there. I think it's beautiful how the Holy Spirit uses people, you know, we're together like this in, in a fellowship. You know, he does bring something out that's new that the Holy Spirit, you know, gives to each of us. I mean, uh, uh, Brother Panaman, Brother Bill, uh, and made that mention to me, but it's always the Holy Spirit, you know. we got to give, uh, i got to give him the credit for that, but 
my point is, you know, like I said before, I can see, even use an idiot like me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, brother Ronnie, you're very humble, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, there's no doubt the Holy Spirit is working greatly through you. I've seen it. No, no, I've no, seen no, it. No, no, no. Are, are you going to interrupt me now after I'm trying to compliment you? Yeah. Don't interrupt me yeah. when I compliment you. Bro. <laughs> All the brothers, you know, all the brothers are, are, are just so full of the spirit. And, you know, you're complimenting me, but I learn so much from you guys. It's uh, And I'm so blessed, you know, after I'm done. Okay, go ahead, compliment me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've, uh, there's a hundred or two hundred times I've, I've, I've read something or listened to you, and, and I got some wonderful insight, and it's, uh, the way you expressed it is beautifully expressed. I, I, isn't it interesting uh, how I read the same verse and it didn't even dawn on me that the, the association of bread and wine the way that Brother Ronnie saw it, saw it. And then when Bill heard that, he recognized that as kind of a, a revelation or as Brother Ronnie said, kind of a download where God downloads a thought in this and gives us, it gives us an idea. Uh, we, we might not have thought of it on our own, but but it's a it's a revelation from God, and now uh, I'm I learned something I didn't see it myself. Ronnie saw it, but now I've learned because of this fellowship and this this study together. So that's how it's supposed to work. We learn from the scriptures, we learn from the Holy Spirit, and we learn from the brethren. You know, I think it's just wonderful. Let me just cut in really quick. I, I can't get over this in, in a way. To me, it's like a miracle and a wonder all wrapped up in one. It's how God can take a verse and speak truth through a, like five different ideas and still come to the same truth, but through other people's experiences, how other people are hearing it and bringing it into the fellowship. I mean, I, th I think it's miraculous. Okay, I'll stop boring you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, Ready to go to sleep? I mean. <laughs> okay. I'll go to the next verse unless someone wants to continue on with this. Uh, 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 verse uh, 18. Uh, but the path of the just is a sh the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not, not at what they stumble. Well, that seems to bear out what um, Brother Ronnie just said. I mean, where the light, the Lord is our light, and those who don't follow Him stumble and fall. It seems to bear out. I think what he was just saying about the the comparison to the bread and wine in the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Also, it says the path, the light, you know, shines in the path of the just, right? More and more into the perfect day. Think of us, right? We're saved by grace through faith, and we're justified, freely justified by Jesus when He rose from the dead, and we're shining brighter and brighter, more and more towards the day of His return. But I also see this as uh, our time now is, uh, you know, the uh, the day is kind of falling because we're go it's going to come to a time of deeper darkness before the light, you know, Jesus Christ returns. But it's kind of neat to know that. But under the new covenant, we're justified by Christ, and that light in us shines more and more unto the perfect day. And that perfect day I see I see is either going home to be with the Lord or uh, His return. Okay, I'll shut up again. What about uh, this term here? Uh, I'm trying to. I'm looking at the comment. Bill posted it there, but I'm, now I'm confused. It keeps jumping around. I better go back to my notes. It says, uh, uh, but 
word is that a lamp unto my feet and a light unto the path. Psalms 119.105. Yeah. Yeah, basically, was, that, that verse you read just earlier, which was verse 18, so you don't get too confused. I know it's a frame because it jumps about in the chat section, but, you know, as soon as that come out, you know, Psalm 119 and verse 105 come out, you know, and, and I'll... Um, a kinnon, obviously the word, as in Christ being the word. So if you if you could imagine taking away the word and and add Christ in, you know it's like thy Christ is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Because Christ already describes himself as the light of the world, and he describes himself as this narrow path. So I'm saying, you know, you've started a spiritual snowball here now, you have, <laughs> Ronnie. But you know, this is what this is what happened now. Wow, wow that's Beautiful. Another beautiful. another verse that springs to mind is that no one lights a candle and puts it under their bed so it cannot be seen. You know, you think these people are worried about their bed coming on fire, though, you know? <laughs> Bless you, brother. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, anybody who wants to comment on verse 18 uh, when it says the perfect day. But the path of the just is as the shining light that mm -hmm. shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I'll say the perfect day is is, is Christ's return. You know, redemption. That the, the actual the perfect day when all is perfect again. Yeah, I'd agree. The day of the Lord. I'd say it was that as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's go on to wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait. Now this is in the Old Testament, right? So this can be applied to both. You know, to, to the uh, saints of the Old Testament, looking forward to the first coming of the Messiah. And, and now that we know that he did come, now we're looking towards that day of his, his second coming. Hmm. So, so he's he's there. You know, Jesus tells us to look for him throughout the scriptures. You know. And don't just look for eternal life, but look for him in there. So uh, it speaks of him. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Uh, let me see if I have my... Okay. Uh, Brother Bill identified the perfect day as the second coming. And yeah. Brother, Brother Ronnie uh, identifies the perfect day possibly as the first coming. And oh, Paul. Very interesting. Well, I'm just saying you, you you brought up the idea of the first coming and and, uh, and that the perfect day. I guess uh, I I don't. They didn't know about a second coming before he before the first coming, did they? No. What what I'm saying is their perfect day maybe is reading this is looking towards the coming of the Messiah. You know, the day that he comes. You know, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but we, in a new covenant, can look at look back at this and, and see it as the second coming for us. You know, yeah, I understand. My question, my I, have question. A, I have a question. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question because I'm not very good at my uh, date uh, dates in the Bible, but it was Proverbs written after Daniel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then they would have known about the second coming, if, if that's the case. Oh, then you're right. You're looking towards the second coming. Well, why do you say that? Because Daniel wrote in chapter nine about it. Uh, do you think that the Jews understood that it was referencing a second coming? That's my question. Uh, I think so because Isaiah wrote about wait, the first wait, wait, coming. Wait, 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 you you got to let me finish the question. Hang on. Sorry. Second. The uh, I I don't know. Uh, if the Jews even understood that there would be a second coming. And if you can say that Daniel 9 is stating it clearly, uh, but maybe Daniel 9, we can see it now looking back. A lot of times you look back and you can see things clearly. But at that present time, they couldn't see uh, the application of the verse. Uh, I, don't, I never really thought that the Jews realized there was going to be a second coming. They expected only a first coming. 
Well, a lot of them still think there's a, uh, they're yeah. still waiting for the first coming, but... Um, yeah. I'm, I was just going to say as well, just going to interject, sorry. yeah, because I've, I've got it on my computer because it's quite helpful to me when I do, you know, you know me, me exegesis on different things, but the uh, Proverbs was written probably about, you know, 400 years before Daniel was written. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, fair enough. I, yeah, that's fair enough. I didn't know. In that case, it is probably just referring to the first coming in. I apologise. I know, I know what you're talking about, though. I know what you're talking about, Daniel. I know. Yeah, I can understand. Because you that. see, I, my thought was, I I don't know when Isaiah. As I, said, I don't know too much about the dates. I don't know if Isaiah was written before these these books, and it was clearly prophesied in Isaiah that there would be a of Jesus's uh, birth and. Death and all his ministry was in that book as well. David was about a thousand years before Jesus, and, and Isaiah was about 700 years before Jesus. And uh, if Daniel was after that, then I wasn't aware of it. But uh, that, that I do, I am sure about David and, and uh, Isaiah, though. But a lot, okay. a lot of these, because that's why you know the beauty of the scripture, because it says that, that, that it's a double edged sword. That oftentimes it has a meaning deep than what you know. We could all be right here. It, it could have a dual meaning, so it could be referencing the, the, the first coming and the second coming. You know, oftentimes the scripture would refer to a, a physical situation as well as a spiritual situation. So, and that's you know all why I believe that word is a double-edged sword. It's not a single edge; it's double-edged. Yeah. Well, what? Well, I should have. I did a study on uh, old text, Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus and blood atonement, but actually I changed the title of it to uh, uh, the Bloody Trail, and I and I talked about all the instances from from the first one in the where God gave the the animal skin to Adam and Eve, all the way through the scriptures of examples of blood coverings, and uh, uh, the, in that in that study, one of the things that was um, emphasized is that they were looking forward and they couldn't see things nearly the way that we can see things. When you look back, you have the benefit of hindsight and being able to see how the scriptures have all played out. And so uh, I think right now we're looking back and we can see an application that this perfect day could be thought of as the first coming. And we can we know that it also could be thought of as the second coming. Okay, let's go on to uh, verse uh, twenty. My son, attend to my words; incline thy ear, thine ear unto my sayings. Let them de not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. I was going to say, if you go on to verse 22, that yeah. gives us the context again, and that, and that sums up again what we've been saying you know, right from the beginning. Okay. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Okay, um, Brother Bill, since you mentioned that, we elaborate on that, please. Yeah, again, like I said, all, all these signs that, that, that in the Proverbs, where, where it's speaking of life, you know, by keeping the commandments and, and, and doing what is right, are to do with physical, temporal blessings. Because we already, early on, in, before anyone else turned up, we, you know, we, we, we made the obvious that, that eternal life and salvation isn't about our obedience to, to, to the, the Hebraic uh, commandments or any commandments in that sense. It's through Christ alone. So the application of, of the commandments and the blessings thereof are, are for temporal things, things on earth and, and things to do with life. Whereas, you know, New Testament, it, it's all to do with Christ alone. So and I think that, that that's summing up for us. Mm -hmm. Because it yeah. says, you know, that's that's why I said those verses, you know, for they are life unto those that find them and health 
to all their flesh. So we know it's talking about flesh, obeying these commandments and doing, you know, these these boys' signs. It is to do with blessings of the flesh, not of the spirit, because that only comes through Christ. Uh -huh. Okay, we've got uh, we got three verses there. Let's go one at a time and just take turns. Each person, tell me what you how you see each of these verses here, starting with uh, verse. Um, uh, 20 my son attend to my words incline thine ear unto my sayings listen listen but the next verse I, uh, I would have to say uh, meditate on them. scripturally meditate on them. so keep them in your heart yeah but we're not on the next verse yet I know. <laughs> I cheated. <laughs> okay, uh, Brother Steve, Stephen, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Yeah, I think that is what saying. This person, Solomon saying, listen to these words of wisdom. I agree with Brother Rod. Listen. Did you go into a different room or something? We could hardly hear you then. Oh, sorry. Mike was up. Sorry. Um, no, I said I think all it's saying is Solomon saying to his son here, just listen to my wor words of wisdom. Uh, there are times in our lives where we all need to listen and not speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brother Bill? Well, yeah, yeah, listen is a good thing. Sometimes, you know, we're, <laughs> we're all too noisy and too busy. We, we do oftentimes miss that still, still voice. And you know, and, and this still voice is coming from Solomon to his son. And, and in regard to us, yeah, we can still listen to the words of Solomon because they're from God. Uh, but that that is what avails to us the still voice, the, the the word of God. Yeah, well, he's saying incline thine ear, and obviously the ear is for listening. So, is he certainly emphasizing pay attention? This is very important. As we said earlier, in the previous chapters, he compared. Uh, attaining wisdom to attaining silver and gold and precious gems. He, that's how much he he said this is so valuable. Getting this wisdom. Uh, let's go, go to the next verse now. Uh, uh, Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Well, yeah, just re-emphasizing there. So first, you need to listen. And once you've heard it, fix your eyes upon it. And once your eyes are fixed upon it, then it's steadfast within your heart. Yeah, so about um, reading, understanding, learning, uh, and maintaining what you've listened to and keeping it close to you at all times. You know, I think there's a scripture that says, meditate on the word day and night. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, we take scripture, you know, a lot of people can't even understand. They can hear this over and over again. And without the Spirit of God, they're not going to get on, uh, any kind of understanding at all, you know. But we do, we as Christians, uh, sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit, we can have the Word of God in us and keep it in us. And not only is this good, good, good uh, advice toward us, these two verses here, to keep them in your heart, but the Holy Spirit reminds us. You know, He helps us. And ought to understand it where other people can't. Well, don't you think that, uh, you know, a man has his own part, role, and his own responsibility too, instead of thinking that the Holy Spirit is going to do it all? Uh, what is, how, how is it possible for us to play our part when it says, let them not depart from thine eyes, and mm -hmm. keep them in the midst of thine heart. Uh, Brother Ronnie mentioned the scriptures, and he also mentioned meditation. So I think both of those two things are, that's our part of verse 21. Hmm. I mean, don't you think... It's saying that we have a responsibility. He says that uh, let them not depart from thine eyes. Okay, how do you do that? 
that means you look at the scriptures all the time. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes on the scriptures. Keep, you know this. What he wrote down here is the scripture, and he's saying, "Let not this depart from your eyes. Read it over and over again, all the time." And as Brother Ronnie said, "You meditate on it so that this gets into your heart and becomes part of you." All right, we'll go to verse 22, unless uh, someone wants to add to that. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Brother Bill explained that. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Uh, again, I have to apply it to the New Testament. You know, I have to see the scriptures this way. Um, for they are life unto those that find them. You know, that wisdom uh, of, of the word. Uh, she was, you know, I mean, life comes from the word, and the word became flesh, right? So, uh, you now back in the old days, they didn't have the help of the Holy Spirit. And I, I give a lot, I have to give most credit to the Holy Spirit for any and all part of my life, including remembering the scriptures. Um, and, and for my own personal guidance, I can look back at this now and say, yeah, it, 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 these are great things to learn. But even to state, you say personal responsibility. I think the person, personal responsibility as a Christian is, is to live in the Spirit and live by the Spirit and be guided by the Spirit. Because when you don't, when you step out, that's what, at least when I step out, that's when I was getting trouble. And I end up getting... Uh, you know, worked over by the Holy Spirit in a nice way. Okay, Ma, let me ask you then, how can a person abide by this saying here? Uh, mm -hmm. let, uh, let them not depart from thine eyes. If well, that, that's good. I mean, you learn the scriptures, right? You meditate on them and you memorize them. Now, well, then that's, the that's, problem with the Holy Spirit is that he, he, would, he would remind us of those things that Jesus taught. Jesus is throughout the whole word, right? Well, when you say read, read the scriptures and memorize them, that's my, man's effort. Yeah, and that is our responsibility. It's it's up to each of us to decide: Am I going to spend time in the scriptures? Am I going to read them over and over again? Am I going to memorize them? Am I going to meditate on them? That's not the job of the Holy Spirit. No, but it's the our job of the Holy Spirit. It's our, it's our, job, it's our job to be diligent to do those things. Okay, isn't it the Holy Spirit's job to give us the understanding of the scriptures? And the That's whole what we're, talking about. we're not talking about understanding it. We're talking about keeping it in your sight, it says. It says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Mm -hmm. It's up to each of us to, to make a decision that I'm going to keep the scriptures in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And to get it in your heart, that comes from repeated study and prayer and meditation over these scriptures. I don't think you're, 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 under, you're still understanding me. I, I'm not arguing with you. Can I I'm say something? To, Sorry. The sin is a tapestry. I think it works together. Because if you're going to be reminded of the things that Jesus taught, you have to read what he taught. Mm -hmm. Hey, brother, right? did, you ever, did you ever see that video I made that titled Arguing is Good? Well, I don't know, but I'm not trying to argue with you. What I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm trying to weave this in together. I think they both fit. No, but you're, you're. You, listen, when I when I title a video saying arguing is good, mm -hmm. what do you think that title means? Can I this say something controversial? No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, okay, let me hold on, on then. Brother Ron here. When I when if I make a video and the title is arguing is good. How how could arguing possibly be good? Because you can discuss both sides, and uh, well, you know, know. Come... that's my point. And now, uh, two or three times now, you've apologized, saying you don't want to argue. And I say arguing is good. You, no one's getting that's angry. Uh, you're you're expressing a different viewpoint. And that's a, that's a form of arguing. You argue saying, well, I see it this way, you see it that way, let's discuss it, and we can learn from it. That's what we're doing. We're yeah, oh, okay, I agree, but I'm not, I'm not saying your point is different from my point. It's that they both weave in together. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I just don't want you be, to feel defensive about disagreeing well, with me. I don't ever feel defensive about I disagreeing with me. So. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to ever feel. Oh, I can't. I can't disagree with Brother Luke. Uh, or otherwise, he might think I'm arguing with him. I don't. I don't look at it that way. I want everybody to feel free that you're. You can disagree and say, "Hey, uh, Brother Ron, I think Brother Luke, I think you're wrong on this," and then tell me why. And if I'm wrong, uh, I learn something. Okay, so that's how I see it. And it's, um, we we don't let the argument turn into something ugly where where it becomes. Uh, Anger enters into it. We just we discuss it with courtesy and respect, and we can disagree. As a matter of fact, if everybody always agreed with me, I wouldn't even want to talk to anybody because it would be very boring. Why do I need everybody? There's a saying that uh, two men who always agree, one of them is unnecessary. I so, think what I'm trying to do, and I agree with you, but uh, what I was trying to do is think, saying that we can read this also from a new covenant point of view. <laughs> Along with how God teaches us, actually Jesus teaching us, um, out of the whole, uh, out of the old uh, covenant views, work or words, uh, and, and putting them together, and, and seeing how okay, God gives you this wisdom prior to this time, prior to the Holy Spirit coming into us. You know, we study. Uh, you know, we have to uh, memorize them. Maybe not even understand what we're reading. But we, we memorize them, we keep them in our heart. Okay, now what I'm saying is we can add the Holy Spirit in this. Yeah, we, we have our responsibilities, I agree with you with that, because otherwise we can't, the Holy Spirit can't bring to memory what we don't, what we already, we haven't already been taught. What I'm saying is the Holy Spirit will give us understanding, and He, when we forget, He will bring up to us. Now, why I say this? Please, please forgive me, but why, why I'm really bringing this up is not only am I an idiot, but I have uh, I have had strokes, and I couldn't remember. And when I was in the hospital uh, last year, for a length of time because of the blood clot in my lung, I had strokes in my head. Back to me after I woke up out of a coma with scripture after scripture after scripture. And... That's what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit brings those things back to your memory when you need them the most. And uh, so, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my point, the only point I'm making is that uh, uh, we we should not be slack in, in in recognizing that we too have a responsibility to be diligent to study the scriptures daily, and and that's what I'm getting out of this verse is it saying keep it in your sight. Okay, uh, brother. Brother Stephen was anxious to say something. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I'm just going to throw something in the mixer and see what happens. But I'm not so sure that it is actually telling us to read the scriptures daily because this was written hundreds of years before the New Testament. Um, so I'm not sure it's actually referring to that. Well, why do you think I I said? Uh, we're talking about New Testament. There were scriptures before the New Testament, weren't there? There was indeed. And I think this is probably more referring to the law, or what's known as the law of Moses, rather than the New Testament covenant that we know why, today. Why don't I can, why, under, I can understand the connection? Why don't you think it applies to exactly with the subject that we're talking about? He's talking about this very uh, writings he's putting down here in the Book of Proverbs. Yeah, he's, but he he may not be referring to scripture at all. Is my point? Um, and you don't consider that that scripture? I, I'm not saying I don't consider it scripture. I'm just saying that he may not be referring to uh, to necessarily be saying that we need to be reading the scripture every day. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's not that's not necessarily what he's trying to imply. Here. It's a controversial point. I understand that, and it may not be right. But what I'm saying is that it may be, it can be interpreted a slightly different way, depending on the point of view. Uh, all right, all right. Let me. Uh, this is how I. It seems <laughs> clear to me. It says, "My son, attend to my words." Now, the words. What are the words? The words he's writing down right here, and put your scripture. Incline thine ears unto my sayings. The sayings are the things he's just written down here. Let yeah, them but it wasn't words. scripture when they were written down at the time. 
I, I think you're getting semantic now. Uh, he's just saying, look, continue reading this over and over again. And I think the same thing could be applied to all of all the scriptures, uh, where it's, it's, we should try to keep them in front of us. Uh, if, if you don't think they that, shall not live, they shall not live. They say, you know, I think I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm just saying there could be, it could be a different interpretation. It may not be necessarily saying mm -hmm. study this. Oh, it's very good to read the scriptures every day. I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I'm saying is. That there could be a different interpretation, just trying to throw something else into the mix here. I, I, think I like what you said, though, too, is because, we, you know, if we put it as saying, well, we have to read Scripture every day, we're not under any kind of bondage to have to do that. I think that's what he may be trying to say to us, uh, the brother. That, that's my point. That's the entire yeah. point, Brother Raw, because I think that is it. If we, we, you we have to... If somebody tells me you have to do something. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think I don't think he's uh, he's making the point of. Uh, I agree with Brother Stephen on this point that we won't we don't want to take it that far. It's not become some kind of a legalistic thing, and I'm not saying. And you know, I, everybody knows me. I'm certainly not going to impose any kind of legalism on people. But I'm saying, Brother Ronnie is attributing everything to the Holy Spirit. And I say, we, we can't do that. We, we, we have to accept that man has some responsibility too. Don't you think we have a, our role to play and say, okay, I want to be responsible. I want to study the scriptures. Uh, and now, you know, don't, don't take it a step further and say that it's uh, now I'm becoming a legalist and trying to impose this as a rule. Oh, no, I use to read scriptures every day. Let me ask Brother Bill to comment. You say that. Let me ask Brother Bill to comment. Right, well, quickly, I was going to say, Steve. If you care or not, that we're going to have to call you Dean. Because <laughs> Dean, <laughs> Dean looks like a spanner in the work every now and then. I'm so but, sorry. Yeah, but that, that aside, I think we're, we're all coming to the same point at different angles. You know, me per, this, I, I talk from a personal experience that, that I suppose before I was probably saved, you know, I, I'd, I'd read scriptures willy nilly. You know, and sometimes feel compelled to, or you know, even a woman might read them. But I can remember when I truly got born again, when I was truly saved. You know, I was hungry for the word, and I believe that's why they both these angles come into one because I believe it's the Holy Spirit that gives you the desire to read the scriptures, and reading in the scriptures gives you the desire. To, to draw closer to God. So I believe we're all coming from the the same angle, but different perspective. You know what I mean? It's the same point, but different perspectives. You know, because Scripture, me, I love Scripture. You know, I'm, I, I mean, I really do. And and while we was talking this, I, I straight away it came to my mind was two Timothy three fifteen, straight away, and that that was the advice, you know, given given uh, young Timothy, and it says, and that from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we know that, that, that the scriptures itself, whether they're, they're, they're being read or whether they're being all rated to you, are really a key issue in regard to becoming wise unto salvation. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So... You know, if someone's all right in the scriptures and they're speaking them to us, that's the same as reading, I believe, because our brain takes. Some, everybody's different. Some people are dyslexic. Some people can't read. Some people are blind, but they're getting the holy scriptures, you know, given to them in a form that that, that, that they can hear and understand it. And, and I suppose we're we're a real blessed generation and time that everybody that there isn't hardly a human being on earth that that hasn't got scriptures in front of them, whether it's by the internet, whether it's by a book, whether it's by a pamphlet. So we're in a really extra blessed time. But time before then, many years ago, you know, before everyone had the scriptures, it would have literally been, and, and I can honestly say it, that it would have to be the Holy Spirit kicking right into gear to, 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 to speak these truths into people's hearts because they never had the scriptures. So I think Brother Ronnie and Brother Luke are coming from getting to the same point, but at different perspectives. That's what I believe, anyway. I could be talking absolute rubbish, 
<laughs> but I hope not. Because <laughs> I only just want to encourage and just try, as you say, you know, iron sharpen the fine. And, and I think, you know, that's what's going on. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, all right, brother, but what I'm saying, brother Luke, real quick, uh, you did say you'd read the script, you should read the scriptures daily, but you said it in the context of Solomon almost saying that. Now, yeah. I do. I do have to. Uh, I. I'm sorry. I do. I do. I, I've got to bring the Holy Spirit in all the time. And in, in, for me, anyway, let's just say for me. Uh, I'm a Gentile. I'm a Gentile believer. I was never brought up under the law. I was never a Jew. Uh, my my past is such that well, you guys know a little bit about that. It's not so good. I know it's the Holy Spirit that encourages me to read Scripture as much as I do, and and and, and it's a it's an enjoyment to me. Uh, prior to, to getting saved, now I would have spit at you or thrown a book at you. You know, I would have thrown the Bible back in your face. You know, um, and there's a lot of people out there like me. Uh, I have to depend on the Holy Spirit for stuff. Everything, in fact, memorizing Scripture, studying Scripture, putting the Scripture in my heart. The desire to read scripture, the desire to pray, the desire to uh, um, just, uh, pray for others, you know, all that. So, sorry about that. But I'll, see, I'll keep uh, bringing him up. Let me, let me say, the, take the last word on this, and then, I'll, then we'll move on to the remaining verses here. Um, um, for, Brother Ronnie, you, you just um, kind of quoted me, but you misquoted me. You, you said that we... Uh, well, how did you phrase it? We must, or we've got to, we've got to read the scriptures. Maybe it was you should read the scriptures over there. Yeah, yeah. There's a difference between if you say that Brother Luke said you've got to read the scriptures every day, yeah. and, and Brother Luke says we should read it because you're going to be wise. As says, and, and now that so that's the first thing. Don't uh, maybe that's how you interpret what I said, and that's why you said it that way. But I never expressed that. And uh, everybody knows me. I'm not trying to impose uh, scripture reading on anybody as a legalistic thing, but uh, we're talking about wisdom. Now, if if you or, or or Stephen don't see what I see in this verse, that's fine. I I, I see it, and and you see it differently. But uh, I, I don't see any other way of interpreting this when it says, um, "Let." M Attend to my words, incline thine ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from their mind, thine eyes. I don't know how it can um, uh, not depart. How it could not depart from your eyes unless you're looking at it all the time, and uh, keep it in their heart. You you said it was talking about meditating. So read it every day, meditate on it every day, and and you're going to have a healthy, long, prosperous life. You'll be wise. Not because it's legalistic to uh, be you know, better doer. You're not a Christian. Uh, now I want to move on. Uh, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, <laughs> and perverse lips put far from thee. Uh, I always love that that word froward mouth okay so let's talk about verse 23 and 24 go ahead well yeah for uh, verse 23 I, I think that really correlates excellent with what Christ said in Luke 6 45 you know and Christ says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, right, his mouth speaketh. And I just think that, that fits in absolutely perfect, with, you know, with, with verse 23. Because the issues of life, these are the things that come out of, out of the heart. So if you're, if you're a wise person today, in, in, in right now, and if you want to apply that, that proverb, in today's life, then you need to really accept Christ, and and you need to at the issues of your heart comes Christ. You know that that that's what I really think is, you know, to me that's what's speaking to me. You know, and the context in that, you know, then, you know, would be good and godly things. 
you know, if you keep diligent, which is good and godly, then then, then the issues of your life will be good and godly. In today's society, the only way to be honest, to be good and godly, is to have Christ Jesus living inside us. If that's the, you know, if you're getting right to the the, the brass tacks here, the bottom line, that's the only way you're going to do it today. Mm hmm. I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> I'm saying out of this. I, I liked what he said, though. You don't Forward. have any, you don't have any Forward mean deceitful? Forward. Does that mean deceitful? No. Well, well, that's what my Bible says it says. What does yours say? Yours says deceitful? Yeah. Hey, Brother Bill, could you find that in some other translations so we can look at it? That's different. It just means to be a difficult person. I know that anyway without even looking. Because we, uh, we, I think we still use it. Well, we do in this part of Essex. You know, if you're a froward person, you know, you're a pain in the backside. You're, you're, you're a <laughs> difficult person. Okay. So, you know, you're just contrary. Or whatever, you know, if I said something, you'd say contrary to whatever it is. You know, that is a froward person. Okay. Yeah, I'm surprised my Bible says uh, deceitful. That, that's surprising. Well, I suppose, I suppose, well, I don't know, yeah, I suppose deceit would go along with it. You know, if you're controversial and you'll go everything contrary to what I say, you, you, you've got to be deceitful, wouldn't you? Because if I'm speaking the truth and you're being fraught, that's being deceitful, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, here it is in uh, various translations. Uh, Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from, far from your lips. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from the corrupt speech. Uh, put away from your you crooked speech. Put devious devious talk far from you. Uh, put away from you deceitful mouth. You got NSB. Is that what you're looking at? NSB. Oh, King James. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. No, King James is not that. King James is the froward. That's what we believe. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I got a little number next to forward, right? And yeah. that's what it means over here. In the middle oh, okay. Uh, so King James says froward. Another one says, don't, don't let your mouth speak dishonestly. That would be deceitful. Uh, and don't let your lips talk deviously. Never talk deceptively. Remove perverse speech from your mouth. Keep devious talks. So a lot of these translations are looking at it as, uh, as uh, that one says, it, as a being devious. But I look at Froward. To me, if we hadn't dis uh, discussed this at all, what I think Froward is this. Look at my face. That's really? a Froward mouth. Well, that's a pain in the backside. Can you see me? I agree with Brother Bill. A disagreeable. That's oh. from someone who's disagreeable. But, uh, okay, so now we see it's, it has more than one meaning. Yeah, I've just looked up the Oxford as well while he was talking about it, and I think what I said, it agrees with what I said. It's just basically a difficult person, someone who's contrary. So, yeah, yeah I, don't know, I don't know why the translations are translated into that. When, when in essence it is just someone who's controversial, who's a, you know. But all right, so put away from now, put put away from the froward mouth or a deceitful or a disagreeable person, perverse lips, perverse lips, uh, put far from thee. Uh, now verse twenty five. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor the left. Remove thy foot from evil. I don't know about you guys, but uh, these last few verses here in King James, uh, I, I don't have any idea what it's talking about here. I'm going to look it up in uh, the whole thing up in uh, something else. Let me see. Parallel. Uh, for... Chapter four. I, I, I must be too English coming from Essex, because they make perfect sense to me. 
Yeah, me too. Uh, t can I say what I see here? Yeah, go ahead. You, you keep your your eyes looking right on. That means you, you don't put your eyes down when you're talking to pe people. That could be one thing. You know, keep yourself honest. Make sure that they know you're honest. But uh, what I see here, too, is, is like keep your, your eyes straight on. You're on one path. Ponder the path at thy feet. Keep on that path. And your way will be established. If you're not right hand or to the left, remove thy feet, thy feet from evil. Once again, I got to go back now to the Holy, the Spirit of Christ in us. I mean, He does this for us and in us and through us. And see, that that's what I think separates us from uh, living by the law of sin and death. We don't have to live by that law anymore. We don't have to worry about sinning or not sinning because the Spirit of Christ in us guides us, uh, you know, to not do something or to do something. And, and I like how, how, how God relates us back even to, into the Old Testament. But back here, he has to tell you, and in the New Testament, he tells you inside you. Well, you know, his laws and everything are written in your heart. Mm -hmm. You've, uh, th this whole subject of the Holy Spirit and, and Scripture uh, is uh, kind of opening up a big can of worms. I, I, I have a question I'm dying to ask, but it's, it's uh, it would probably take quite a while to. I I guess if if you guys are available to go a few minutes longer than we normally do, I'll, I'll ask this question here. First, let me just read this whole thing in uh, um, in that what they call the not inspired version, the NIV. So some people call it the not inspired version, but for me, this is plain English, so it's easy for me to understand these verses. It says, keep your mouth free of perversity, keep corrupt talk far from your lips, let your eyes look straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you, give careful thought to, to the... the to they by path for your feet, and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now that was pretty easy to understand, and that's plain modern English. I, you know, I, I get that. Uh, so we can talk about that for a minute, but I'm going to pose a question that is going to be uh, controversial. Uh, and once we're done with this. Right, far away. I'm sitting here waiting. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, you want to say anything about these these remaining verses before? Because we'll close out this this topic of proverbs, and then I'm going to uh, ask this other question. But anything else to be said about these final verses here? No, no. Like I said, the way the way the NLV put, I don't like. I, said, I don't personally like the NLV, but you know, I, I the way I read the King James is exactly the same way as you've just. Quote the NIV, so I see it the same way. Mm -hmm. but like I said, it's probably because you know we're, we're, I'm still an Essex boy, and we're, I think we're we're still a little bit old-fashioned in Essex and Suffolk areas of Britain. So we're they call us backward, believe it or not, over here because we still use words that most of England don't use anymore. But to me, you know, the, the King James there made perfect sense, and also did the NIV when he just quoted it as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, both. Both work for me there. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else want to say something about these verses? All right. Uh, let me let me pose a question here for everybody because this pertains to this this idea that uh, about uh, the, the the Holy Spirit's role mm -hmm. and the role of the Scriptures themselves. Uh, I had someone come to my home Bible study many years ago, and he was a stranger. I never knew him, but he came in for the first time, and he he was putting forth in the in the Bible study the idea that the, it didn't matter what the scriptures said. We we're trying to show him something that the scriptures said because he said something that nobody agreed with. So we're trying to show him from the scriptures, and he, his answer was. I don't care what the scriptures say, uh, the Holy Spirit told me. And my question to him was, I said, okay, uh, for me, uh, I test everything by the scriptures. But for you, you're saying the Holy Spirit is, is um, your authority. But let me ask you something. 
you tell me the Holy Spirit says ABC about this. And the guy sitting next to you, what if he tells me the Holy Spirit told him that the same thing tells him DEF? Now you're both telling me that the Holy Spirit is telling you this, mm -hmm. and, and yet you're giving me two contradictory explanations. And yet you're both convinced that it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, telling me. So um, that was my issue with him then, and that's my concern now, is that uh, I, I obviously, I mean, I, I agree, as we all do, that the Holy Spirit is transforming us. The Holy Spirit is uh, revealing things to us. We learn from the Holy Spirit. We learn from reading the scriptures. We learn from talking to the brethren. All these things are legitimate ways of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I, uh, uh, I, I'm concerned that if, if someone says that dogmatically the Holy Spirit says it's this way because he, they revealed it to me, okay, mm -hmm. you're entitled to say that. But but I, I, I'm going to not accept that. I'm going to accept what I see the scriptures tell me. Okay, can, can I give my answer to that? Yeah, that's what I want. My thoughts on this are, are, are this. If you're born again, blood-bought Christian, you're sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit encourage you, encourages you to get into the Word, to learn everything you can about Jesus, about the Father. Uh, you know about the, uh, the Holy Spirit. God teaches you, but it's for me. I'm not saying everybody know, but for me that had me dwelling in Scripture day and night. You know, night and day. It was like a, a brand new, oh, holy everything. Light just came into my life out of the darkness, that, that filthy darkness I came out of. Uh, so I did dwell in the Scripture a lot. So then when somebody would come up to me and say, well, God told me to tell you this, or God says this, the Holy Spirit tells me this, the Holy Spirit will bring up Scripture so that I can use the discernment using the Word and, and prove to that man that by the Word, he's wrong, and the author of the Holy Spirit, or author of Scripture is, is Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Spirit of Christ in us, but it does take study, but what, what, the only thing I said about studying is like Solomon was trying, it sounded like he was saying that Solomon was saying, do this daily. So that almost sounded like a, uh, not that you were saying that, you, you misunderstood me, brother. It, it's that you were saying what Solomon was saying to his son, and that we can apply that to our lives. And that almost sounds like Solomon was uh, pushing a, a demand on him. Okay, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, this is the only difference I'm trying to say. Please let me finish because I'll forget what I'll say, okay? Um, it, it's that the Holy Spirit encourages us in the Word, but we love the Word. See, that's the difference now, I think, is that we love the Word and we eat it like food for our spirit. It's, it's, it's our life. It teaches us about Jesus. It brings Jesus closer all the time to us. You know, so even when we're away from the Word, we still practice, we know the presence of God, but we always go back to the word for discernment on whether somebody's right or somebody or, we, or somebody's demanding saying the Holy Spirit is saying this, but if the word says differently, okay. can you have to tell them, you have to uh, counsel them, rebuke them. Now, you're, applying, you're applying this towards the uh, subject of Proverbs that we studied. I, I was asked, not even applying this, Asking this question about that, I'm asking you about. I, I cut that, that into. It. Did what? you hear what I said? If, if somebody says something to you that the Holy Spirit told them, you can always bring it back to the Word. That's what. I, yeah. It is third, my, but the Holy Spirit encourages encouraged me to get into the Word and love it so much, and so it was easier for the Holy Spirit to bring back scriptures to my memory. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, that's not really the, kind of the question I asked, but uh, thanks for giving me the information. But let me get Brother Bill. Uh, uh, when I posed the question, um, giving giving weight to the Holy Spirit versus getting weight to what we read. Uh, the problem is 
you, you can have two people testify. The Holy Spirit told them something, how they interpret the Scripture. And yet, you've got two opposite interpretations, and they both testify. The Holy Spirit told them. So, Brother Bill, what's your, your answer to that? Well, the way I say it is the Word of God, if we're talking the written Word of God, is our compass. So, if, if you had the, the scenario you gave earlier, you know, someone says A, B, or C about, you know, suffering in regard to the situation, then someone says, you know, D, E, and F in regard to the situation. Now, the Holy Spirit is not going to go against Christ nor the Word. So that is why the word is so important that, that, that you know, if someone says, well, the Spirit has said this, we go back to our compass, we go back to the word of God, and, and, and if it confirms with the word of God, it glorifies Christ, then he's speaking from the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't confirm with both, because it has to be both, you can't just, because people can corrupt and twist scriptures, it has to confirm with Christ and the word. If, if, this spirit that is speaking with this person confers with both, then you know it's the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't, then you know it's a false spirit and it's a spirit of an antichrist. So I think that is that is why the Word of God is so essential and so important to us, because it does. You know, the Holy Spirit's job, you know, is to seal us, to point us to to Christ, and to confirm the Word. Because you know, holy men of old writ writ these scriptures. And, and, and it was through the Holy Ghost. So if, if a person, con if someone says, oh, the Holy Spirit said this, if it contradicted the Bible, then it's not the Holy Spirit because he wrote the Bible anyway. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, we, we, you know, the men who read it were just a pen, you know, but the hand itself was God himself, wasn't it? the Holy Spirit, who actually give unction to these people all to write it. So that is why the scripture is, is vital and we're so blessed. We really are blessed. That we're not, we're not, you know, in a time of old when we was under the Roman Church, where we weren't even able to read the Bible. That must have been really hard to discern truth in them days. And, and thanks be to God, He was merciful that you know these poor folk, you know, had a simple faith, didn't know nothing but just believed on Christ. They probably made a million mistakes because they didn't know the Word. They had no compass, but you know, <laughs> through God's mercy, they were saved, I believe. But we're in a blessed time. We've got the Word. And I think we suppose we need a, every opportunity we can is, is, is to read it and, 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 and to quote it. Mm -hmm. Brother Bill, I think too that uh, I agree totally with what you said. Uh, but also, Brother was talking about two people's opinions of one scripture. What I like is, is to be hermeneutically uh, correct. I mean, you got to go in and you got to make sure that it's within its context, right? And... Yeah. and because a lot of people take things out of context and they, and they make up all kinds of weird stuff. But brother, if we, like you're saying, be led by the Spirit and by the Word, we got to keep the, what the verse says in context or what the teaching the, the person is trying to tell you. Look it up for yourself. You know, see if it's in its context. And like the brothers, uh, brother, uh, oh God, see here we go. There goes my memory short term. But the brother here too, it's it's like uh, he has changed my mind on certain things, you know. But me going back and, and looking and seeing the correct context, I mean, he helped bring me out of the work salvationist nonsense. Uh, say you know, say through works plus you know Jesus. But it's if when you go back for yourself and you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you within the context of what the Scripture is saying, you know, I think that's where the sermon comes from the Holy Spirit too. Does, am I making sense? Well, yeah, because you can't, like I said, you can't have, if you just had the scripture of no Holy Spirit and no Christ, it's useless. You know, yeah. you, you have, they, these work together. Because God knows how we work. God knows that, you know, we, to be honest, we're all, in comparison to God, we're all simpletons. And, and we yeah. need stuff written down as a compass for us. Because we would forget. Yeah. We'd go off and attack. There's so many spirits out in the world at the moment. Without the, the, the stable compass of the Holy Bible, the Holy Writ, we'd be off in all sorts of tangents, wouldn't we? <laughs> Listen to yeah. Spirit. But this is thanks be to God again that he has, you know, he himself he breathed the Holy Scriptures. They're God-breathed. So mm -hmm. this is why we're so blessed. 
Let me ask uh, Brother Stephen if he wants to answer the, the question. Uh, the specific question is the the example I gave you where people are saying that the Holy Spirit told them something about the, the, what a verse means or a doctrine. And, and but they're both testifying that the Holy Spirit told them. They got it from the Holy Spirit. And they're putting their confidence in it because they got it from the Holy Spirit, and uh, they're, but they're but they're don't, not in agreement. Well, I think this um, this can be a matter of different interpretations. Sometimes, if it's scripturally right, you can check it with the Bible, as we've already been stating, because that is our compass. And sometimes we can miss. Sometimes when um, somebody says something, uh, and we doesn't. Um, appear to be exactly scripturally right to what we're reading, we can cause problems because there's a slight difference of interpretation of how it's being put across, but if the context of what they're saying is basically in line with the scripture that you're reading, then I think that to me is a sort of guideline. Um, I think with the, you know, we're, sa we're saved by believing in Christ and in these other things God uses to bring us out of our childhood into adulthood. I think there's a verse in the Bible that says that as you get older you learn to put childish things away uh, and the Holy Spirit helps us, encourages us to read the Word, helps us to pray, helps us to do all sorts of other things that we would do in our lives generally um, and it is part and parcel of being a Christian um, and I think sometimes when people say things and, and it's not necessarily totally what we're reading in Scripture, um, then we, we have to use Scripture, as Bill says, as our compass. But we have to be careful because it also might be just a misinterpretation because people interpret things in our ways. God puts them in our, I believe if the Holy Spirit puts it in our head, we interpret the way we see it and not necessarily how God would have said it. Good. I like that. Very good. Very, very, very good. All right. Let me let me say one thing, and then we'll we'll do uh, close the show here with uh, an invitation to the audience. Uh, uh, I I've never had any confidence in saying to anybody, unless I'm reading a scripture to them, I'm not going to say, "Thus saith the Lord." And in other words. I'm not going to present myself as, I'm a prophet from God, God revealed this to me, thus saith the Lord. I mean, there, there are times in the scriptures where we see this term, thus saith the Lord. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, uh, oh, I, I would not dare tamper, tamper with, with that idea of a saying, thinking that I have the ability to say, thus saith the Lord. But I've, I've come across people that actually are doing that, that because they think that God has given them this revelation, it's through the Holy Spirit, and therefore it's the same as God said it, and it's thus saith the Lord. So that's why, for me, uh, I don't accept thus saith the Lord from anybody. I don't won't do it myself. I just say, here's what the Scripture says. And that's why, that's why I think that uh, I want to rely on Scripture rather than, you know, someone's... Uh, uh, claim that it's spirit revealed. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's go to the uh, final uh, part of the show, which is the invitation. And if someone's watched this today, uh, they they if you watch this whole thing and you're at this point with us, then you you must have uh, found this interesting and maybe uh, beneficial to you in some way. But we we talked about uh, these these things of Solomon. And the things in, in uh, Judaism for, for the laws of Judaism, uh, these things are were not intended to, to give us salvation. These are not m the means by which we go to heaven by by understanding and following law or getting wise and doing wise things in our lives. That's they're intended the, the, the laws and the wisdom that's intended to give us a blessed life. Uh, so if if, that, if that's not how we go to heaven, how do we go to heaven? What do we have to do in order to go to heaven? If someone's watching now and you want to know, Brother Bill, will you tell them? 
Well, in real simple terms, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In the most simplest terms, you know, I just wanted to quickly say, and it is going to tie into a salvation message, which I believe every hangout should end on, is that, that could you imagine how dull and boring life would be not being a Christian? Have you seen how much fun we've had tonight? Where we can discuss things, we can have a laugh, we can really get into a good debate, and, and we're having a good time. Yeah, we, we agree and disagree on certain things, but, you know, what a, a colourful life we have with Christ. You know, we have something to look forward to, not only in this life with discussing the scriptures and, 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 and feeling God speaking through us and the love and joy and fellowship that brings, but we have an eternity to look forward to. And that is with Christ Jesus, it's only found through him. You know, if you think of all these different people, Buddha, Muhammad, all these different people, you know, that, that, that some people say are mighty prophets or deities, you know, none, of the, none of those have been risen from the dead. None of those offer eternal life. None of those were sinless or perfect. You know, these are just people. These are wise sounds and good ideas, but they would avail nothing. You know, the, the, the Word of God, you know, if we've been talking about the Word of God, it says, and, and it's a little, you know, it's a historical book within the Bible called Acts. And it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, Christ is the only way that we can be saved. And the desire is that we must be saved. And that verse that I just quoted there brings us on to, 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 to the only time in Scripture that, that the question is posed. And I, I love that verse so much. You know, it's the Philippine jailer. You know, the apostles there with Silas. You know, and, and, and the, the jail is just about to kill himself. It, it was the end of everything for him, you know, because in those days, if if someone escaped from a prison after an earthquake, which occurred, you know, they was as good as dead in their family. And he was just about to kill himself. And, and the Apostle Paul and, and, and Silas, they said, you know, don't, don't kill yourself. Then he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. That is how simple it is to be saved this day. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's also important you get the real Jesus Christ. Because there's many false Christs out there. There's many false Jesus out there. Jesus is a common name. And it was in them days. It must be the Jesus Christ who loves you so much. And the one that scripture records who died for all your sins. Every single one of them. Past, present and future. The same Christ that was buried, and the same Christ that rose victorious from the dead, having been risen, being the first fruit of many, to show not only did he have power over life, and not only was he God manifest in the flesh, but he had power over death itself, that he could raise himself from the dead. And those who believe in him, the promise is that when you die, because everyone's called to die once, then judgment. When you die and you have trust in Christ Jesus, you will be risen again. This corruptible, that this this flesh that we live in, this temporal, you know that that that's got ninety years of we're lucky, you know, and it's gone. It's corruptible. But if you used to believe on this Jesus Christ, who died for you, was buried and rose for you, you would put on incorruptible, and you will live forever in eternity, in paradise, and in joy, and the ever abiding love of God Himself. That is absolutely amazing, and that's a. That's a win-win situation. That's something that anyone with any common... Well, we said common sense earlier on in the program, but really it's uncommon sense. But anyone with any sense or sensibility left would really go for this perfect deal. And it's a good deal that has been cut by the blood of Christ. It's not a deal that we could make or a deal we could enter in of ourselves. This is a win-win deal that Christ is offering every creature this day. So I would implore anyone listening to this, you know, if you've not enjoyed the program, I don't care. If you've enjoyed it, thanks God, and I hope you're blessed. But at the end of the day, if you get something, believe on this Jesus Christ who loves you today, and believe on this Christ who wants to spend eternity with you in paradise and in joy. Believe on this Jesus now, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Brother Bill. And if you're watching this and you... 
understood this message from Brother Bill and you understand that this truly is good news you heard, that Jesus wants to give you eternal life if you'll put your faith in him and nothing else, then let us know if you decide to do that. And uh, we'd love to hear that good news. Uh, thank you for watching, panelists. Let's keep talking after we close the live broadcast and visit. And, and uh, I, I hope you'll join me next Wednesday for Chapter 5 of uh, the Book of Proverbs. We also have a live show on Sunday. And Sunday, we're doing a character study on uh, one of the main characters of the Scriptures, Abraham. All right, thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.